uh, do you want to introduce yourself and tell a little bit about the work that you do and your favorite pizza? <laughs> oh yes, that was unexpected. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm Dr. Patrick Cavanagh of the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies and I work on the Mid-Infrared Instrument Team, which is one of the four science instruments on the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, we've just recently completed commissioning of, of the Mid-Infrared Instrument and the instruments on JWST and are now um, basking in the glory of <laughs> the released science images which were beamed around the world on Monday. Yes, that was mm. exciting, huh? Mm, absolutely. By President Biden, no less. Yes. Um, <laughs> and my favorite pizza yeah. is, I, I don't, it's called something different everywhere I go, mm -hmm. but I think it's a Napoli pizza. Mm. It has um, anchovies and olives and capers. Nice. Yeah. I want to try that's that That's my one. favorite pizza. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's a good choice. And I think it's the first time that we get that one. Yeah, I d it, it's called something different everywhere, so I don't know what it's called in um, in Brazil. <laughs> yeah, me neither. I'll have to look yeah, it up. Yeah, I have to look it up. Yeah. I think it's, oh. it's Italian anyway. Yeah. Yes, but it sounds good. Mm, no, it's very good. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, and, well, as you man have mentioned, uh, the first images were just released, the first data as well this week, I think. Uh, in the package for analyzing and playing with that data. Could yeah. you tell a little bit of the work that was put into creating the package? Yeah, well, uh, so the, the data don't come from the telescope in the kind of pristine images that, that we saw in, in the release. They, they're, you know, um, littered with detector effects and, and optical effects and so on. And the instrument teams work to understand all of these different effects and remove them from the images so you, you know produce these spectacular mm -hmm. images and um, so we under we the instrument teams work to understand these effects we write some code to correct for them and produce some calibration files which the code references mm -hmm. but then the package in and of itself is developed by the space uh, by the um, science software branch at the Space mm -hmm. Telescope Science Institute mm -hmm. they have a wonderful team of developers there who take our knowledge and our yes sometimes very crappy code <laughs> and turn it into a, a real packet a real python package that's you know released to the public and, and also is any data taken with james with the jwst is Im immediately put through that software to okay. produce kind of science ready you know, science ready images and other products as well. That's amazing. And as you mentioned, there was a specific team to develop the package. Yeah. So, so the instrument, so the instrument teams would have worked quite closely with that mm -hmm. team in a lot of ways, and even developed some of the. So, I worked on one of the correction steps, and basically my code was taken and slotted in. Mm -hmm. um, now, it, you know, it was improved here and there, <laughs> but you know, it, it was more or less the same. Yeah. Um, other times code might be delivered in a different language, but mm -hmm. the, the, the team of developers would take that language and convert it into Python Amazing. and fit it into the infrastructure of, mm -hmm. of the calibration pipeline. And particularly I love working with different types of uh, teams across, I don't know, multiple types of knowledge. Mm -hmm. How was uh, sharing well, the room per se, because I know it's from different countries, and so what oh, there's a amazing. lot of things. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, one of the great, one of the best things about working on, on James Webb was uh, working in the MIRI team, and, and MIRI is a European instrument, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, a kind of consortium of, of European countries and three and three or four institutes in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So we were really a mix of about, you know, there was maybe between sixty and eighty people overall. Um, and maybe 40 or so working in the instrument development team mm -hmm. and it would have a mix of nationalities, mix of knowledge and it was just amazing to work in that team. Oh. Um, and then, you know, also working with the teams who were based in America then like the team mm -hmm. of developers uh, who developed the calibration pipeline. It, it, it was just amazing. It's an amazing of our, uh, you know, amazing team to work in for years and when we were there during commissioning it was just such an environment to be in. Um, everybody bouncing off each other and you know it's just incredible oh i can just picture everybody giving all great ideas and working yeah. together that would be a beautiful thing to see yeah. uh in speaking of beautiful things to see uh i know you mentioned it took 20 years to get the telescope up in the air 
Oh, well, yep. not the air, but up in the space. Yeah. Um, how was the process? Because we know data sciences take a long time, at least projects take a long time mm -hmm. uh, to actually see results depending on the project. How was the process of actually getting the first data, uh, aligning the mirrors? Um, so that, that process, so the mirror, I, I didn't have much to do with the alignment mm -hmm. of the mirrors. That was the optical mm -hmm. team who, who did that. But that's very... Um, yeah, that, that was an incredibly slow process. I mean, you're talking about, so each one of the, the mirror segments is, a, is a, it's its own telescope. Mm -hmm. And each one can be controlled to a very fine level. So they basically had to align each one to within, you know, something like uh, have the, the, the mirror position to within a nanometer or, you know, something insane. And then bring them all together to focus each one at the mm -hmm. same point and, and keep Demand. that level of precision mm -hmm. and bear in mind that the telescope you know it, it's still one side of it is facing the sun one side of it is incredible you know it's very hot mm -hmm. and this mirror has to be very very cold <laughs> <laughs> so there's a thermal stability required oh as well God. so the, the technology and the engineering mm -hmm. and the ability of that team to, to focus that telescope was, mm -hmm. was just unbelievable mm -hmm. but they did it incredibly well right and um yeah, and then what was the second part? Of it was about uh, getting the telescope up in space. Oh, getting it in space. Years. So it, it took twenty years. Yes, yes. but I mean, I, I'm sure you're, you're probably aware, and people listening are probably aware that you know the development was troubled at times. Yeah. That uh, I mean, the concept uh, uh, came in the '90s, where, and it was kind of the success of Hubble. Mm -hmm. at that kind of you know astronomers and and policymakers in the states said, well, we need to do something bigger and better. This was so successful. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, the design and the, and the scope of the project was defined back, way back then that it needed to be an infrared telescope to do what Hubble couldn't do. Mm -hmm. and it needed to have the big mirror and so on. Uh, but a lot of the technology hadn't been invented. <laughs> and, you know, people were maybe very over-optimistic with the time scale and the cost of developing that technology. And, you know, it kind of propagated down through the years to be this you know, stop, start, you know, delay, delay after delay after delay mm -hmm. uh, in development and, and, you know, budget overruns and cost overruns. But, you know, they managed to get it through somehow. And in the end, it seems to have been worked away. Everything, like the deployment worked perfectly. Mm -hmm. The mirror works perfectly. The instruments are working incredibly well. And we're getting already, we're getting these amazing images that were released to the public, but already the scientists are getting their data. And if you look on Twitter now, it's just them putting up, look at this, look at this, look at this, you know, and this is the stuff the public hasn't seen yet. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, let's say there's not so much interest in it because it's the fine mm -hmm. detail of the science, but, you know, it, it's going to allow for incredible discoveries. I could imagine. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of Hubble, what is, uh, I think, the main difference is about the type of images that this new telescope can take. How does processing this new type of uh, images brings its own difficulties, what are the challenges? Yeah, well the main challenges in the process and is that the, the detectors are different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Hubble detectors are basically detecting optical light and so they don't need to be terribly cold or mm -hmm. whatever. But the infrared detectors are very cold. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it can introduce lots of funny effects. I mean, you know, because you're really down um, at, so, for, for example, the MIRI detector is at like 6, 7 Kelvin, mm -hmm. okay, which is, you know, minus 265 degrees mm -hmm. or so. So lots of uh, funny effects come in there. The The actual reading out of the detector is slightly different. Mm -hmm. And that Hubble would just ex expose, right? You just open it to the sky and the detector would accumulate mm -hmm. photons and charge and so on and be read out. Whereas infrared detectors, you sample them uh, every, uh, you know, a certain amount of time, almost like a video, mm -hmm. okay, uh, you know, a video samples the scene in front of it every fraction of a second, whereas these, the, the, it does the same thing basically, but the, the time is slightly different. So there's lots of challenges related, to, so there's differences in how the detectors work and mm -hmm. are calibrated, mm -hmm. and, and they're, that they're the main differences in the detector. Interesting. Yeah. And I noticed that a lot of the data processing in the images to make them like look as cool as we see mm. now, because uh, the telescope sees different wavelengths of light, right? Yeah. That's how it works, uh, yeah. making it simple. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, and one question that I had and I was really interested to understand was, 
how long does it take to take one picture? Like that one picture that you showed, I think was your last slide and your favorite picture. The Carina Nebula, yeah. Yeah. Or the star form, it, it, it calls me cliffs, they're, they're called now apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how long does it take? Well, I mean, okay, the, that, that image is kind of the composite, is a, is a mosaic mm -hmm. of many different fields. Okay, mm -hmm. so the telescope will observe one part, move a bit, the next, the next, the next, and so on. So each one of those exposures goes through the, the pipeline, the calibration pipeline, which will correct the detector effects, um, align them on the sky relative to each other, and combine them all. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it will do that for each filter that was used. So to produce a color image, obviously you need a tree filter. You know, mm -hmm. you need, need to say, this is my red, this is my mm -hmm. green, and this is my blue. Um, and those mosaics were created for several different filters for NIRCAM and for MIRI. The image I showed at the end, the really bright, mm -hmm. colorful one, that's the NIRCAM mm -hmm. uh, image. So there was three filters with NIRCAM that were set, and basically you just make a tree color image. Uh, you know, we have tools in the ast in astronomy that do it. There's a program mm -hmm. called DS9, a very you, you know very common program mm -hmm. where you just open the three different frames in a, in the red, green, and blue channels, mm -hmm. and that will just burst out. And then you, you know, of course, you play with. Uh, cuts and scales and everything mm -hmm. to really bring out the detail, mm -hmm. but it's it's not it's not very difficult. I, I you know once the calibration <laughs> once the calibration is done, mm -hmm. it's not very difficult to produce images like that using programs like DS9. Interesting, and I think the calibration is probably the hardest steps to get right. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. that's the one that takes the longest, probably. It does. Uh, it again, it kind of depends on the uh, so let's say the number of exposures. Mm -hmm the length of the exposures it, it, there's a lot that determines how long it takes but you know it, I, I think the aim um, if I remember right is to have the calibrated data in the hands of the astronomers within a day or two mm -hmm. of the observation that's fast it's fast yeah yeah so there's a very quick turnaround it you know there's other wavelength regimes like radio and so on where the mm -hmm. data sets are enormous and that takes a lot more processing. Mm -hmm. But for something like an infrared telescope, it's really, um, yeah, it's it's not excessively long. Mm -hmm. And uh, and indeed, it's quite fast. They, they've got it, the, the, the whole pipeline of going from the telescope being, uh, the telescope, uh, the data on the telescope being telemeter to the ground, running through the calibration pipeline, which is then put directly on an archive mm -hmm. where the astronomers can access it. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. That's lovely. And I noticed uh, on your presentation you showed a collection of steps that you call the pipeline. Yeah, the calibration pipeline. Yes. So the, the, the full pipeline is from telescope to archive. Okay. So the calibration pipeline is the section of that mm -hmm. that does the, calibrate, the, the mm -hmm. calibration of the data. Oh, that's oh, that's amazing. I, I could speak about this a long time because I love, I'm interested in everything even though I don't understand <laughs> most of the things. Um, one thing that I, I was interested in understanding was, uh, for example, you mentioned that now we have a package that anybody could download, could do pip install and yep. use it, and the data. And how does sharing that information do you think would be helpful for the Python community to have access to it? Uh, I don't understand. I mean, uh, in the sense of having the data and more people being able to use it. Um, how will it uh, sorry, uh, yeah. affect the research, uh, the researchers, and help researchers ah, okay. expand their? their yeah, work. I mean, it, it's essential that researchers have full, and I mean it. They have full access to that pipeline. Mm -hmm. They can, you know, clone the repo, mm -hmm. make changes. You know, if they if they feel so. Basically, the the data when it comes from the telescope, it goes through a default mm -hmm. pipeline. Okay. The parameters of the various calibration sets are set on the most general and best understanding of the instrument teams. Mm -hmm. So the data when it's finished will be science ready. But for example, let's say you're looking at a point source, you're looking at a star, okay, mm -hmm. something that's spatially unresolved, mm -hmm. that all you're seeing is the diffraction pattern of the, you know, of the telescope. Mm -hmm. Or you're looking at an extended source, which is like the nebula, which fills the field of view. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can improve the calibration of what, of either of those types of sources by playing with the parameters because the same calibration, you, you won't get the, the best calibration on both those types of sources with the default parameters. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a, a point source, you can say, well, 
I can change this parameter and it will improve my calibration of, my, of what I'm interested in in the field. Mm -hmm. So because the package is out there, it's well documented, it's in Python, which a lot, like really a lot of astronomers use Python. You know, yeah, and it, it's well documented. They can download the pipeline, install it on their laptop, okay, mm -hmm. get their data, change the parameters, tune the calibration to their needs. Um, they might find that actually I can improve this step by changing one thing or adding a line of code or doing something. Mm -hmm. And they can make a pull request on the package, and the developers and the instrument teams will look at it and say, "This is good. We can include this in the pipeline." Oh, that's and amazing. so on. So that's that's the idea, and I think it was the yeah the kind of the philosophy of having this open development in, in the Python. And do you foresee a lot of collaboration coming from outside sources like this? I I, I outside of the astronomy community, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, within the astronomy community, I'm sure, over the over the years there will be some. I mean, you have to remember the, the telescope is very young, right? Basically, yes. a few weeks old. I, you know, it's been observing the science targets for astronomers now for maybe I don't know, two weeks, three mm -hmm. weeks, something. It's been observing the commissioning data since February, March. So it's just people like me who are in a very privileged position mm -hmm. that would, you know, we could play with the data and everything before everybody else so we have more of an understanding of it. Mm -hmm. But once the community gets more of an understanding of the data in the pipeline, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there will be. Oh, I'm looking plenty. forward to it. Yeah. I think it would be amazing mm -hmm. to see more contributions coming uh, into the field. That would be fantastic. And I love the pretty pretty pictures of <laughs> the stars and planets. And speaking of planets, I know that your favorite image is a favorite image for a reason, uh, and that's because there are interesting things in the picture. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, it, well, it's mainly my favorite image because it's the nicest, <laughs> the most spectacular. Um, you know, there, there is so much science in that image. Yeah. Uh, because you're seeing at the top you're seeing this this uh, material being evaporated off the clouds mm -hmm. you're seeing outflows of young stars so if you look closely you'll see jets and outflows coming from the young stars that are still forming and probably have protoplanetary disks where there's planets and solar systems forming oh, um, you're seeing um, embedded stars that were never visible before because Hubble uh, can't see through the dust basically whereas Infrared radiation will move through to dust, so it provides a window into these regions that we could never see before. Um, the level of detail, because of the size of the mirror, <laughs> is, is unbelievable, especially in the, in the near cam image. Um, so the the Miri image, I did I don't I did show the Miri image. You did. It was Miri has a slightly poorer spatial resolution because of the wavelength. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the longer wavelength you go, the poorer the spatial resolution is. So it doesn't look quite as sharp but Miri can see further into the dust clouds. Mm -hmm. So you're basically seeing through them, mm -hmm. right? Whereas with NIRCAM, you were seeing into them, maybe not through them. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, and then you had the star field, the the background galaxies, the ever-present background galaxies. Um, they're just they're so amazing. Oh you know? yes, I love that image. And speaking of Miri, I, we said the name a few times already. Well, uh, could you tell a little bit about what is MIRI, what is the work that you put into MIRI to make it happen? <laughs> yeah. um, so MIRI, MIRI is the mid-infrared instrument, um, uh, and it, it, so it's the only mid-infrared instrument on, on JWST. The, the other three instruments are near-infrared, but um, so the mid-infrared kind of sees longer wavelengths or basically colder things. Okay, mm -hmm. so you're looking at colder stuff than in the near-infrared. And we, MIRI itself has several modes. I mean, so far in, and in the releases, you know, general public doesn't want to see spectra <laughs> and things, right? Because they're just boring. They want to see the big, beautiful mosaics. Um, but MIRI has several modes, so it does the imaging. Obviously, mm -hmm. we saw that. But it also has uh, two spectrographs, and um, one designed to look at exoplanet transits. So you know, when a star or when a planet moves across the star, mm -hmm. it can measure the um, the composition of the atmosphere. Nice. 
The other is a very um, special type of spectrometer called an integral field unit, where you basically get a, a picture of the sky much smaller than the, the mosaics, but you have a spectrum from every pixel in that image. Okay, and the power. That's a lot of information. Yeah, and the power in that is, is, is really remarkable. But it also has a suite of coronagraphs, which are instrument or which are, are modes designed to block the light from a, another star um, to reveal the planets that are orbiting. One the, specific one. Um, yeah, no, no, but but it, it will block. So if you if you want to look at another solar system, mm -hmm. you need to somehow block the light from the star. Oh. Otherwise, you won't see the very faint mm -hmm. planets around. So there's four coronagraphs on here, mm -hmm. um, which will block the light, uh, you know, to a very high level, and reveal these planets. So if you kind of observe, uh, you know, over a period of time, say, well, like making and pulling a number out of the air, but let's say once a year, um, you observe the same solar system, then you will track the planets mm -hmm. moving around, and because you have some wavelength information, because each one is tailored to a certain filter, you get. Um, color information so you can tell if the planet has seasons or weather or things like this you know um, so so Miri is a very complicated instrument in itself mm -hmm. uh, and what I what I did I helped I you know worked in the calibration and software development of these steps that mm -hmm. went on to be part of the pipeline I worked on the simulator so the Miri simulator was used extensively during commissioning to produce um, images of what we thought the sky should look like for our commission and observations, to test our tools, our Python tools, which mm -hmm. we used to, you know, commission the telescope. It's also used by the scientific community to kind of test their models. So, for example, if a scientist comes up with a a, a model, a theoretical spectrum of a young star, mm -hmm. they can put it through the simulator. To see what Miri can do, mm -hmm. um, so you know it will convolve the, spe the spectrum with Miri's, Miri's with the properties of Miri, let's say. Um, so you can tell if some specific emission line you're interested in is observable or not, uh, or how how much time does it take to reveal that emission line? Things like this. So. Oh, that's um, amazing. Um, yeah, and the, there were those are my big two things. And obviously, the commission and working on console and. You know, being in the control room um, for so for a cool. couple of yeah yeah it was amazing that was really amazing. Um, I think that's it. I also I'm also a scientist. You know, originally mm -hmm. I'm a scientist, <laughs> um, so I, I I work in some of the science programs uh, which now start right now. Mm -hmm. The kind of calibration stuff is finished, so my role and all that is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. But now the the science takes over, and we just found out actually that tomorrow one of the uh, I. Maybe you shouldn't say the name of it, but anyway, one, there's a, another spectacular object being observed tomorrow. Oh, that interesting! We're involved in, and we should get a press release. Oh, so we can soon. expect something. Yeah. Oh yeah, I yes. Know. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I'm I'm super excited to see even more information come out of space, and maybe sometime discover new planets and new. Yeah, well, I I think that maybe Eva said in the talk, but you mm -hmm. know, where will not? It, okay, it might discover new planets around planets, or, mm -hmm. you know, that are in orbit around the same star of planets we already know. Yeah. But it's not going looking for planets specifically. It's not a planet hunter. It's not a, it's not a, exactly. That was yeah. a, the question I had. It was not a planet hunter. No, but the, I mean, the, we, we, we've had planet hunters like um, Kepler and, mm -hmm. and Tess and, and these things. So it's like the best candidates, the, the most interesting candidates from them will be observed by, by JWST. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be other planets there. So it's a, a teamwork. So James will oh, yeah, help yeah, yeah. figure the, out where to point the yeah. camera so they can find something. Exactly. There's no point in putting two observatories to do the exact same thing <laughs> in orbit at the same time. Uh, so, you know, there's throughout kind of space-based astronomy, there, every telescope design has been to complement what's already there or to, you know, you know, if it's the next generation. Of, mm -hmm. of that kind of, uh, of the telescope but you have to work on the strengths that are already there mm -hmm. uh, to you know really tie everything together to push the entire understanding of, of space uh, a and astronomy bit a bit further yeah. yeah oh that's amazing oh i'm super excited to see everything that i can because i haven't seen all of the pictures yet uh i was right here at real python already so i'm i'm waiting mm. 
Oh, that would be amazing. Um, I have one question, and it's mostly for our listeners that might be interested in following in your footsteps. Mm -hmm. So, do you have an advice for people? Um, no, not really. I mean, like, you know, I always get asked that. Yeah. And what can I say? I went to school like everybody else. <laughs> I, you know, I went to prim primary school, we call it here. Uh, or element, I guess elementary school in the US, um, you know, high school, went to university, did physics, you know, nothing special, like, you know, didn't go through, you know, some uh, weird path to it or anything. If, if, if people are interested in it, it's possible to make a career out of it. You make sure that you do the right subject in university, mm -hmm. or, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, right, right subjects in high school mm -hmm. to get you into the course you want to do in university and okay some research is needed uh, you know to know which university would be the best mm -hmm. uh, in this area or the area you're interested in and you know push to get in there because if you don't try that's that's there's a piece of advice mm -hmm. if you don't try you'll never know mm -hmm. just try take the risk okay because there's been times when um like i i could i you know i had positions somewhere else or uh, uh, or you know doing something like this <laughs> you know just just anything but um, there's no point in saying no to various things or saying oh I won't do that because I don't think I can do that mm -hmm. give it just try it um, and if you if you work hard and you're lucky and it, you know there is an element to look mm -hmm. okay just, but you have to be in a position to take advantage of that look when it comes along yeah. and if you try and you work hard and you get your chance then yeah it you can really happen. it might happen yes Yes, I, I, I feel the same way, especially like if you are prepared for the situation when it happens, yeah. uh, you'll probably will have luck because, enough. Because, I mean, we have Brazilian astronomers here, right? So in, di in where I work, we have uh, Pauli McGuinness, who's Brazilian. Mm -hmm. And I, I, think, I don't think she's here anymore, but Alina Vidotto, I think, is Brazilian as well. She was in Trinity College. Um, yeah, I don't I, remember. I, uh, no, maybe don't put that bit in, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I think she's Brazilian as well. So she was here and is not anymore. Understood. Did you want to ask something? <laughs> okay, yeah, and, and I think that's a great advice because, well, I tried a lot of things and, well, I'm happy that I did, happier that I did than I would be if I didn't. So, yeah, that's a good piece of advice. Do you want to tell our listeners one thing that you love about working with data, especially this working very with data. different... Good question. Uh, I, I don't know. I have no good answer to that. <laughs> um, one good thing about working with data, I, well, do you know what's great about working with data? It's, uh, in, in the last, since I started working on James Webb, I, I had some Python before. Mm -hmm. Okay, not, not an amazing program or anything. Back then, maybe now I'm a bit better, but um, having that skill, mm -hmm. when because not everybody, not, not okay, I said astronomers have some Python, and many of them do, but it might be to plot an image or, you know, mm -hmm. do something relatively straightforward. But actually, as a skill, it's an unbelievable asset in astronomy, because I can take some data mm -hmm. and do an analysis so quickly on it and put it into some kind of package that I don't need to write, you know, I, I don't need to write it again and I can share it with others, that I can, I can take data and very, very quickly have a spectra, lines fitted, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the ease at which I can do it now, and the ease at which I can understand other people's packages or, you know, whatever, uh, is, a, is, a, is a real... Sometimes when I'm doing it, I kind of think to myself, wow, I'm actually really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a stu like, stupid thing to say, but, you know, it's, it's not everybody who can do that. So, like, just having that uh, strength in Python is... is mm -hmm. um, yeah... That's uh, yeah. I guess that's it. That I'm just always surprised myself about how quickly I can do that now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Feels a little bit like magic, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. Like it's just like power. it opens up a whole new yeah. kind of power. Yeah, power, right? So some kind of power that opens up to you that you can really uh, do things quickly and efficiently. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I am right there with you. When I look at, at things that I do now and that I when I started, mm. and I was like, oh my god. Look at this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you can never stop learning it either. That's the best thing. There's always something else that you can learn. Oh, 
yes, constant learning is, consistency is very important too, yes. Thank you so much, Patrick. It was an amazing conversation. I, I feel so privileged yes, that no you problem. accepted. Yeah, no problem at all. Thank you. Thanks.